Okay, we're live. Hello, Howard Bloom. Uh, it's, it's, it, I'm looking at a message uh, talking about Lina, um, saying a message to everybody. So I'm a little off base. Jen, it's wonderful to see you. <laughs> it's wonderful to see you too. Welcome to Humanizing the Icon, this uh, live chat series that has launched um, during the pandemic, but was an art exhibit actually in the Venice, at the Venice Biennale in October, aligned with my Mary Pickford film. And we started cracking open the paradigm of icon um, from pop culture to spirituality to image everything. We've been deconstructing everything. And Chelio was an artist that showed at that exhibit that I curated there. And um, he transforms all of these talks into, into live works of art. And um, he's from Italy and we love him. Hi, Celio. Hi, nice to meet you. Ciao, Jennifer. Hi. Ciao, Howard. Yes. Hi, Celio. Very, very excited today. It's very good energy. And we are composition to the many persons. Today, we see what's up. We'll okay. see what's up. Yep. Let's see what's up. All right, Chelio, thank All you. Right. We'll talk to Chelio at the end when he delivers us his messages. Okay. Okay. Ciao. Um, okay, so Howard. So should we do an intro on who the, in the world I am so that the audience has a clue? Yes, yeah, so I want to talk about who in the world you are. And then I want to get back to reminiscing on how we met and why we connected and what brings us together. Um, so yes, give us, give us some highlights. Well, highlights, um, I'm the author of seven books. Um, the best known of those books is The Lucifer Principle, A Scientific Expedition into the Forces of History. And the newest book is Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll. There's a 66 minute documentary on me called uh, The Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom that became available on July 21st. So you can find it on Amazon and Apple and all kinds of places, just about every place except Netflix. Okay. And it won, it won Best Film at the Design Science Film Festival in California. And it's going to be, it's been shown at a bunch of festivals. One of the festivals it's got coming up is uh, the Not Film Festival in Italy, which should be interesting. In Italy? Yes, right. Where? And there's the Raw Science Film Festival in LA. We've done the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, and we did Doc NYC here in New York City. And the response, Jen, the audience response in the New York debut was unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. I've spent a lot of time in my life with audiences from audiences of 200 people to audiences of 120,000 people. And I have never seen a response like the one this film got. And when the lights went up and when the director and I went on stage, the director is Charlie Hoxie. He's a three-time Emmy winner. Um, every single face in the 224-seat theater was beaming. They were radiating. The smiles on their faces were so broad that they nearly went all the way to their earlobes. Yes. Um, it, was, it was a kind of energizing it's hard for me to characterize, but the people in the audience called it uplifting, they called it inspiring, um, all kinds of things. Then when we did the Santa Barbara International Film Festival for the Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom, there was a guy who came to see it twice. Um, there were only two showings. Mm -hmm. And the second time he came to take notes because he regarded the film as a practical course on how to lead your life, which is pretty damned wait, amazing. Wait, 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 I have, a, I, have a, I have three questions. Yeah. <laughs> One is, is your computer on your lap? My computer's on my lap and I should have gotten a pillow so that I could put it up at an angle more like this. Well, it's just shaking, um, just so you know. Oh, but it's shaking, okay, so that's because it's on my lap. Okay, um, that's okay. We, so, won't, we won't get nauseous. <laughs> so, at, so, and I'd say Michael Jackson and me, the book, is getting astounding quotes, absolutely phenomenal quotes. It's being said that it doesn't matter whether you're interested in music or not, this book is a major piece of world literature and will change the way you see your entire world. And the interviews, I've done dozens and dozens of interviews for the book, and the interviews are strange. 
because they're like conversion experiences. The people doing the interviews go through a conversion experience, like a religious experience. And it's hard for me to pin down how, except a central theme in the book is finding the gods inside of yourself. Okay. Because so that's what musical performance is all about, the gods inside of yourself taking over. And, and when people get this atheistic yet mystic point of view, um, it, it seems to fit something they've needed all their lives. Where in Italy was it? Um, I'm not sure. It's a name that's so obscure that I can't remember it. Okay. But it hasn't happened yet. And, and it's supposed to happen, at, I think, at the end of this month. And it is the end of this month, isn't it? Um, and if it does happen at the end of this month, I'll probably go over with the director. Because okay. I've never been to Italy. Jen. Oh my goodness, it's so magical. Um, and speaking of magical, when you say conversion experience, just in layman's terms, you're talking about something mystical or transcendental or something. All of those things. Energetic yes. that just kind of takes over the experience well, in the body. We've never, we've never talked about this, but um, since the age of 12, I've been hunting down the ecstatic experience. No, we've um, talked about it. We've talked about okay. it. But I, want, I want to back up a little bit just so okay, go ahead. we can kind of track the story here. Right. So, so what, I'm looking for enlightenment. I'm looking for the kind of ecstatic experience that St. Teresa had when she was in her uh, tiny little uh, monastic cell with stone cold walls in the middle of the night. And she felt an angel appear next to her bed. And the angel stuck a steep spear into her side. And it was the sweetest sensation she had ever felt in her life. And suddenly she was flying above mountaintops and across valleys, um, wrapped in the, uh, in the love of God. And from the point of view of that love of God, she saw all that was spread out below her. That's the kind of experience I've been after all my life. And William James, in a book that I discovered at the age of 14, after two years of this hunt, called The Varieties of the Religious Experience, said experiences like St. Teresa's are psychopathological. In other words, they're mentally ill. But in the hands of the right person, a psychopathological experience can be an engine of history. In St. Teresa's case, St. Teresa established an order of nuns that has been around for 600 years. So this is amazing. Do you remember when I came to you in New York, when I had been seeing like energy and auras for like a week and I right. showed up at your apartment in New York because I was like what is going on right you remember that yes I remember it and you and I what got you told me what did I tell you what do you think you told me what would oh be, my god if uh, somebody that, comes to you today and says that what do you tell them look there is in a sense an aura whether it exists or not mm -hmm. um whether it exists as a visual experience or not it is a visual experience when it's in you and, and once upon a time, in trying to understand the audience experience, um, I ran across a book on auras. And it made sense, even if it's just as a metaphor, because when you have a, a theater audience, like the play you did at the Cherry Lane Theater, which is still probably the most astonishing theatrical experience Thank I've ever seen in my life. Thank you for coming to see my play, Howard. Um, it was amazing. I came because it was you. And <laughs> But the, you start by being very self-conscious as you walk into the theater, especially in my case, because I was followed by a cameraman everywhere. And, um, and you're very conscious of how you look to the people behind you and the people on either side of you. And you want to look cool. And then the lights go down. And slowly you become, you become absorbed in the performance. Your individuality disappears. And then it's as if all 500 of you, or whatever it is in the Cherry Lane Theater, um, it's as if all of you melded into a common amoebic blob of energy. And the best way to explain that is this, there is a common aura. Um, and then that energy blob reaches out to the performers. And it goes through them as if they are empty pipes. And they have an out-of-body experience. And for the rest of the performance, that energy of the audience is dancing them. And they are very aware of how every move they make is widening the eyes of the audience or losing the attention of the audience. And yeah. they not only play to that, um, it's like the energy goes up to somewhere around their heads, is utterly transmogrified, 
and pours back down to them. So I did a live podcast or live YouTube with Harry Hamlin. Harry Hamlin, the actor from LA Law, the sexiest man on earth, according to People Magazine and all kinds of stuff like that. Right. And Harry is a really disciplined actor and he gets all kinds of amazing parts. And I asked him with the footlights shining in your face, how do you sense that aspect of the audience or do you sense it at all? And he said, you can hear them breathe. And I suddenly remembered in that in 1988, I became extremely sick and was stuck in a bed for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I had to become an online personality because I was too weak to talk. I couldn't, I couldn't utter a single syllable and too weak to have another person in the room with me. But I could go out on the internet as long as my hands are strong enough to reach my keyboard. They weren't always that strong. Okay, I want to back and up. I want to back up. Wait, I just want to <laughs> tell you the point. The point of the story is that I started to become an online Lothario. You know, I started to have online romances. And you hear every breath of a woman that you're on the phone with, every single breath. Harry said, I hear the breathing of the audience. And suddenly because of that online Lothario experience, I understood exactly what he was talking about. Like this heightened, it's like the senses just completely blur. Right. And, but you pick up on the audience. You're totally yeah, focused on the audience. Hyper, the audience is, hyper, hyper. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I've experienced that as well. Um, right. So let's let's go back to how we met and what our connection was, because I think right. that's really important. Do you want to share? Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll explain it. Um, I used to write my books at a cafe called The Tea Lounge, a big, dark, cavernous space, huge. Um, and I met this guy, um, he was about 23 or 24 years old at the time, um, and his name was Jeff D'Elia, mm -hmm. and, and he wanted to be a music manager. So I tried to recruit him to my way of doing music management because I want a successor in the business. There's nobody right now in the entertainment business who searches for souls and brings them to life. Mm -hmm. um, who connects an audience with the authenticity of the deepest soul of the artist. And that's an essential, that's an essential role of, of art and especially popular art in human life. And right now humans are being denied that experience. They're being denied the icons that you're talking about in the title of your show. So we got into this discussion and he said, oh my God, you have to meet my sister. She makes films. Mm -hmm. so, so you and I met. And you, you and your former partner, Julie, became my bunny rabbits, mostly you. Mm -hmm. and, and I just loved every time we got together. And if I hadn't seen you for a long time, even though I don't get time to hang out with people, I just don't get time. Um, I made the time to come into your office at Grand Street. You guys made the time and came out to see me. And we went up to uh, Prospect Park, my favorite place and sat on the grass until you discovered 10 minutes into sitting on the grass that the insects were eating you alive <laughs> and wanted to flee the park as rapidly as possible. <laughs> and I've seen Billy Bates, your first film twice, and asked the same question in each um, discussion <laughs> session because the film struck me the same way each time. Um, and I've been Which following- the I remember. Uh, it was that the, the sexuality of the guy who's at the center of the film, um, is in his sexuality, in order to be fully emotionally there, he basically has to reenact the scars of his childhood. Mm -hmm. And so when he gets into bed with a woman, it's a very crowded bed because it's not just him. It's him, his mom, his dad, the woman, her mom, her dad, and they are going through things that happened at three years old and five years old because those are at the very core of everyone's mm -hmm. sexuality everyone's sexuality and so i basically commented on that twice and you were very aware of the fact that you'd already heard that comment <laughs> from me before i love it now it feels like the first time so we so, had a very like powerful connection we would talk about energy and genetics and sexual energy right. and art and right. you did really like how i would bring an art like actual artists from the fine art world in, right, and you the, did that with Billy Bates. Into the cinema. You've done it with Chelio, right? And you're with Clay. On a four, so you're working on a four-minute animation with Chelio right now. Chelio's pictures are extremely dynamic. That means when you look at a flat, unmoving uh, canvas, 
you see things emerge and then blend back into the background again and then emerge again. You see it as if it were an animation. So Chelio's work is an animation begging to oh, happen. This is beautiful. Um, and we always talked about collaborating, I think. Oh yes, I really wanted to do a film with you. Um, but, but ultimately, Charlie Hoxie made that. Well, there, Jen, not only is there the Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom, the film by Charlie Hoxie, there's another one. Um, a long time ago, 15 years ago or something like that, I was contacted by Buckminster Fuller's film biographer, whose film had already been shown at Yale, even though it was incomplete on Buckminster Fuller at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to interview for my Buckminster Fuller film. And I said, but Noel, I don't like Buckminster Fuller. And Noel said, no, it's Noel B. Murphy. Noel said, it doesn't matter. I need to interview you anyway. And so he drew, he has a 65 foot long bus that's a studio. It's a rolling studio. So he rolled his studio over to a street near me, Union Street, mm -hmm. and came down to my house and he shot me. And then he got back to me a month or two later and he said, you're the narrative backbone of the film. What? I don't even like Buckminster Fuller. It's just that I understood Buckminster Fuller's childhood experiences. So Noel is working on a film called Dinner, My Dinner with Howard, or My Dinner with Howard Bloom, depending on what day of the week you're speaking to Noel. And he's very much in the throes of the creative process. So there will be a second film coming out. And, and this is very strange because in the documentary world, it's well known that once somebody has done a film on a subject, you cannot have another film on that subject um, because there isn't the money for it. You won't be able to find the funding. Doesn't matter. Apparently, there are going to be two true. films There's about me. There's multiple films on, on certain subjects. But what I also want to refer to, which I think is really important, um, you spoke about my brother and your connection to the world of music management. So can you tell us about that? Right, that okay, well, a little, a little bit of background. So at the age of 10, I became involved in theoretical physics and microbiology. Um, I, at the age of 12, I, I got together, my, I had my first scientific credentials. Um, I built, I, I co-designed a computer that won some science fair awards. I built my first Boolean algebra machine. I was taken for a meeting with the head of the graduate physics department at the University of Buffalo, my hometown university. Yeah, it was probably supposed to be a five minute courtesy session. It was an hour. We were discussing Big Bang versus steady state theory of the universe. Who were you channeling? The, Einstein or? Uh, well, a whole bunch. I was reading two books a day at that point. So I was channeling the whole scientific field, everything cool. that I could get my, my hands on. And he came out and said to my mom, you don't have to save for grad school for him. He'll get fellowships at any grad school he wants in theoretical physics. And I was also being tutored by the head of research and development for the company that made the valves for the engines that took the first humans past the speed of sound and that took the first humans to the edge of space. So that's when I was 12. But at the same age, that's when I began my quest for the gods inside of us, um, my quest for the ecstatic experience. And when I graduated from NYU, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, the head of the graduate physics department had been right. I had four fellowships, but it was in a field that didn't have a name that yet neuroscience. And I suddenly realized if I go to grad school, that's Auschwitz for the mind. I'm in search of the ecstatic experience. That's a concentration will, camp. Yeah, I will never be able to find that experience given paper and pencil tests to 22 college students in exchange for a psychology credit. Um, so I had an opportunity to get into popular culture and I ultimately founded the biggest, look, I knew nothing about popular culture, nothing. And I ultimately founded the biggest PR firm in the music industry and worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy okay. Idol, Paul Simon, your Michael Gabriel, Jackson people Prince, like that. CDC, like Bette Midler. Right. And you nurtured them spiritually. Like that was the big crux to your relationship with them, right? Ab absolutely, because I told them, I developed a technique I call secular shamanism. And if you came to me to be my client, I would tell you, look, if you expect me to fashion an artificial mask for you, if you, you expect me to fashion an image and sit here like a guy in a checked suit with a cigar in his hand, telling you with this image, I'm gonna make you a star, I'm gonna send you to my best competitor. If you're gonna work with me, you have to understand that music is not about an exchange of pieces of plastic. It is not about an exchange of downloads. It is not about an exchange of money. It is an exchange of human 
soul. And if you work with me, I'm going to require certain things of you. You have to give me six weeks to study every lyric you've ever written, every album cover you've ever put out, um, every interview you've ever done. Then I'm going to come out to wherever you are, your natural environment. And we're going to do an interview that could take anywhere from one to three days with no managers, no assistants, no wives, no one else but you and me in the room. And you know how you sit down at two o'clock in the afternoon because you've got an album deadline ahead of you and you need to write a lyric and you look at a blank a piece of paper or a blank computer screen and you know you could not and never write a lyric again. You have no idea of how you've written in, uh, any lyrics in the past. Mm -hmm. And by four o'clock in the afternoon, there's a lyric in front of you and you have no idea of where it came from. And once or twice in your life, the lyric is so perfect. It feels like the lyric wrote itself through you. I'm going to find the you, the gods inside of you that wrote that lyric. And when you go on stage, you know how you see the faces of the audience melting and then becoming a big amoebic blob and reaching out as pseudopods to you and their energy coming through you and being utterly transmogrified around your head. And you are on the ceiling watching all of this. You have an out-of-body experience. And you watch yourself being danced like a marionette on stage by this reverberatory loop of the audience's energy and your energy pouring back to them, I'm going to put you in touch with the gods inside of you. I'm going to find the gods inside of you that danced you on stage. So if you're willing to go through all of this, then I will consider working with you. Mm -hmm. So that was the basic approach. And again, because music and I was also involved with film, because music and film is about the soul of the audience, is about your soul is about what you reveal of your soul to your audience. Kids will put posters up on your wall when they're 12 years old, and they will grow on those posters. They will grow on that image of who you are. And if it is authentic, they will have something of value to grow on. If it is inauthentic or shallow, they don't have anything to grow on. And two generations since 1988 have been deprived of having genuine icons, icons whose souls shine through everything they do. Uh, performers who can channel their own soul mm -hmm. you feel like and i was yeah you know, we're deprived of that as a as a culture absolutely yeah absolutely so the idea of an icon is extremely important and to give you an idea of what i did one day john mellencamp called me and he said i've been offered 1.25 million dollars uh by heinz ketchup to use hurt so good remember in those days ketchup came in glass bottles and getting yeah. it out of the bottle was uh, a torture. Um, so they decided to capitalize on the torture and they used Carly Simon's anticipation in one ad and it worked. So now they wanted John Mellencamp's Hurt So Good. And he said, should I accept the money? And I said, John, what do you want to be in 15 years? Do you want to be collecting money from your investments or do you want to be on stage in front of your audience? And John said, I want to be on stage in front of my audience. I said, okay, then you have to turn down the money. And here's why. You are it's as if there's a giant city walled off with walls four stories, five stories high. And you are the figure who's outside of that city, raising his fist and saying, I have a right to exist. You may not acknowledge me, but I have a right to exist. And that's what's in your gesture with your fist. And if you accept the ketchup commercial, you are going inside the gates of that city. You are cocktail parting with the people within it. You are part of the walls. Mm. You are no longer the fist. Mm. And so my job was to keep you in touch with your most authentic self. Mm. We need you in the storytelling field. Well, that's, that's why I wanted to groom Jeff, because I felt that was missing um, from the business. And I don't know whether Jeff can do it. I don't know whether it's a unique talent um, that's impossible to pass on. But I did my best years and years ago to, to give Jeff a sense of what it was uh, and how to go about it. And we'll see. Well, I'm glad you did, because he it definitely aligns with some powerful talent that are incredible storytellers. And, full and story, you're right. The story is the key. So I would find the key stories of your passion points, your imprinting moments, and would show you how to give those stories to the press so that you use the press as a megaphone to get through to your audience. Hmm. I need some more Howard Bloom in my life. <laughs> yes. 
So the new book, how I right. accidentally discovered the sixties, right? Well, it's a, this, the book that was new a while ago was how I accidentally started the sixties. That was the first of my memoirs. Because I read a long mem- ago draft of that. Right, exactly. How many revisions has it gone through? Uh, quite a few. I mean, it's not so much the revisions, it's the revisions have really brought it up to date. I wrote the book from 1990 to 1995 when I was laying in a bed two weeks to talk. Mm-hmm. And I wrote it as a series of letters to friends. And then, uh, and, and I tried to write, look, there I was really miserable in this bed. And there were two people who would lift me out of that misery. And one was um, P.G. P. Wodehouse, um, the British humorist, and the other was Dave Barry. So I tried to write those letters up to the level of humor that had taken me above, that had helped me transcend my pain. Um, and when the book was complete, um, I, I, I got hold of a friend who had been on the road with the Jefferson Airplane. He'd been a road manager for them. And uh, said, could you get the book to the Jefferson Airplane? Because they might blurb the book and that would give it authenticity in about the 60s because they were a major group in the 60s. And he said, I have somebody better, send me the book. So I sent him the manuscript, you know, this huge honking pile of paper. And, um, and it turned out that the client that he was talking about was Timothy Leary. Mm-hmm. So Timothy Leary read the book and he said, amazing things. He said it was a monumental masterpiece of American literature and filled with wow, woo, aha experiences and nonstop scientific comedy routines and nonstop waves of hilarity. And he complained, compared it to James Joyce. Um, What I didn't realize until 15 years later was here I've written the book to be up to the level of humor that lifted me out of my misery. Um, This book got to Timothy Leary when he was dying of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, And apparently it must have done for him what Wodehouse and Barry did for me. And that was apparent, because I first didn't believe the quote was real Mm. at all. It was just too good. Um, But I, years later, when I was still stuck in bed, um, two friends of mine, Douglas Rushkoff and an artist from San Francisco came to visit me. And uh, they, it turned out, had spent Timothy Leary's last six, last six months of life with him. And it had been a profoundly moving experience for them. So I had a printer next to the bed. I printed up this quote, which I was sure was phony, um, and gave it to them. And they sat there at the foot of my bed reading it. And then there was this ungodly science silence in the room when they finished it. And I knew why that silence existed. It was because it wasn't a Timothy Leary quote. And they saw how sick I was. And they were trying to figure out how to tell me in a way that wouldn't devastate me. And then Douglas opened his mouth and he said, this is Tim. And you could feel the spirit of Timothy Leary in the room and you could feel all the anguish that these two men had experienced being with Timothy Leary at his bedside when he was dying. And then I realized that the book must have done for Timothy Leary what Wodehouse and Barry wow. had done for me. But so that's the first book, and it's about how I accidentally found something that uh, would later get a name from Time Life Publications, the hippie movement. Mm-hmm. And it's a series of uh, nonstop adventures. And the new book is Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me A Search for Soul in the Power Pits of Rock and Roll. Right. And it's the successor because it's about my experience in the rock and roll business with people like, I mean, Michael Jackson is front and center in this book because he's the most amazing person I ever met in my life. And I've spent my life with amazing people. And he is beyond anything I had ever imagined a human being could So be. can you describe that? Because he's iconic and there's a lot of different perceptions. Um, what well, is well, amazing for, to you? Well, you? What's amazing? Okay, so first of all, when I was a kid, when I was 10, I was rejected by everybody in Buffalo, New York. The other kids wanted to have nothing to do with me and my parents didn't have time for me and uh, and didn't seem interested anyway, even if they had had the time. And one day a book appeared in my lap and it said, the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And it gave the example of Galileo and it told the story as if Galileo had been willing to go to the stake to defend his truth. 30 years later, I'd find that that wasn't true. 
but I needed the heroic version of the story. And the second law of science, look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before. I, okay, by the way, Howard, I say yeah. that to people all the time. I credit Amazing. you every time and it works. You know, uh, it's, to shift the lens and, and see yes, the, like, yes. talking about the drawing and how it's multidimensional. It's like, you see that in everything. Right, exactly. It's, it's like a hologram, you know? Right. So you, you've imparted that on, on me. Oh, that's wonderful, Jim. I, I thank you. So, so, okay. uh, so second rule, look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there. Look for things that are invisible to you and invisible to everybody around you that you all take for granted and see them and then proceed from there. And it gave the example of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the man who invented the microscope. So that's how, that became my religion from that point on. From that point on, I was reading two books a day and cramming as much science into my brain as it could possibly handle. Um, Michael Jackson was the living incarnation of those first two rules of science. The truth, the, the, the law of courage, that's the truth at any price, including the price of your life. Say that slow. Say that again. The, the law of courage, uh -huh. which is the law of the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And the, and the second law is about awe, wonder, and surprise. Look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, mm -hmm. uh, and then proceed from there. That's like so, music what, to my ears. Well, so let me tell you the first time I met Michael Jackson, and yeah. you'll see a little bit of what I mean. We were at Marlon Jackson's pool house in Encino, California. A pool house is a little building next to the pool that's just big enough for one room on the first floor and a set of steps and another room on the second floor. And the first floor room had video arcade games all along the walls. No human could afford video arcade games, much less enough to fill a room. And in the center of the room was a billiard table. So the brothers and I, they, they always put me in the center, Jen. It was the sweetest thing you can possibly imagine. So they put me in the center at this billiard table and they were crowded around me and we were looking over merchandising stuff. And I was trying to explain to them, you guys try to put on the most amazing show anybody's ever seen. Your t-shirts have to be amazing. Your tour jackets have to be amazing. And then I heard the screen door open. And you know, I wasn't raised among human beings. Other humans didn't want to have anything to do with me. I, I had guppies and, and lab rats and guinea pigs when I was a kid. And you don't learn human rituals from guppies and guinea pigs. So I don't know most human rituals. But I had been taught at the age of 19 that if there's so many people want you to meet, you walk over, you stick out your hand, you say, hi, my name is whatever your name is. And the other person will stick his or her <laughs> hand out and give his or her name. Yeah. So I did something I had actually never done before. I walked over to the screen door that was opening. Now, one thing you have to know, I had read a sheaf of articles on Michael Jackson this thick, over a thousand articles. Every single one of them said, Michael Jackson is a bubble baby. If you ever reach out a hand to touch him, you will shrink back in fear. So I reached out my hand he and I said, what? "Sorry, a, bub a bubble baby. A bubble baby, okay, like yes. don't touch him, he'll pop kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. So I reached out my hand, I said, hi, I'm Howard. He reached out his hand and said, hi, I'm Michael. And I told him, I mean, it was normal. It was a normal handshake. Yeah. It wasn't one of those uh, trying to crush your nuts handshakes. Um, but, and it, so it was a little softer than normal, but it was normal. So I told him I had a press release I wanted to read to him. And he said, okay, let's go upstairs. So we went up the stairs. The room upstairs was crowded with amps and keyboards all the way to the ceiling. Yeah. He found an amp he could sit on. I found an amp I could sit yeah. on. Now, Jen, I, I have, let me make another digression. I am very serious about my writing. I have been very serious, serious about my writing since I was 12 years old. And there is a reason. When I was 12 years old, a girl in my class, eighth grade, turned her eyes to me, and that had never happened to me before. And then she made eye contact, and that had never happened before. And she said, I told my mother that you understand the theory of relativity. And I didn't understand the theory of relativity. I understood an awful lot about science, but not that. But I didn't dare confess it to her. <laughs> so as soon as, as soon as school got out, I jumped on my bicycle. I went to the local library where the librarians literally knew me better than my mother did. 
and said, give me everything you've got on relativity. And they rifled through the stacks and they gave me a slid across the counter, a little skinny blue book and a great big fat green book. Um, so I put them on my bicycle rack. I pedaled home as fast as I could. And I started to read the big fat book first because I had learned by that age that if you boil yourself through the hardest thing and you don't think you understand anything at all, if you manage to get to the end, by the end, you've understood something. Mm -hmm. Now, this book was all equations. There were about seven words of English on each page. I have never understood equations in my life. Um, and so I made it up to page 50 by eight o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. And then I realized my parents are going to put me to bed at 10. I have two hours left in which to understand the theory of relativity. I am not even going to get all the way through this book by 10 o'clock tonight. So I better turn to the little skinny one. Well, the big fat book was by Einstein and two collaborators. The little skinny book was by Einstein himself. And in okay. that little- They were both by Einstein. They were both by Einstein. Okay. And in the, and the little skinny book, Einstein had a preface. And in his, in his preface, it felt as if he reached out, grabbed me by the shirt, stuck his nose up to mine and said, schmuck, listen up. And he said, if you wanna be a genius, it is not enough to be able to come up with a theory that only seven men in the world can understand. Mm -hmm. To be a genius, you have to be able to come up with that theory and then to express it so clearly that anyone with a high school education and a reasonable degree of intelligence can understand it. Mm -hmm. In other words, Albert Einstein, through the pages of a book, had told me, if you're going to be an original scientific thinker, which is the only thing I wanted an to original be. Original what? Scientific, scientific thinker. thinker. You have to be a writer, and not just any writer. You have to be an exquisite and extraordinary writer. Mm -hmm. So I started to take writing seriously at the age of 12. Mm -hmm. um, at the age of 16, I became obsessed with Strunk on Style, a major, major style book. It had a huge influence on my life. In NYU, I was kidnapped to be the editor of the literary magazine. Mm -hmm. And I turned it into an experimental graphics and literary magazine, because like you, I can't imagine things without pictures. Yes. And we won two National Academy of Poets prizes. So I have been, and, and NYU thought I would be the next great poet to come out of NYU. Um, so I take my writing very seriously. And it's even, it even shows up, it shows up in everything I do, including press releases. But no one, no one, no one had ever seen that. So Michael was sitting on his amp and I was sitting on mine. And I got two sentences into the press release and Michael began to slump in his seat. And he went, oh. And I got another two sentences in. And he slumped a little further. And he went, oh. And when I got to the end, he said, man, that was beautiful. Did you write that? No one in my entire life but Michael Jackson had ever seen the art in a press release before. No one. And then we went downstairs because we had a meeting with the art director from CBS. And she came in carrying five of the most gorgeous art portfolios I've ever seen in my life, hand-tooled cherry wood, hand-tooled leather, and uh, put them on the billiard table. And again, the brothers put me and Michael in the center. So I'm on Michael's left. My right shoulder is up against his left shoulder. My right elbow is up against his right elbow. My right knee is up against his right knee. So I can feel everything that his body registers. Mm. And she slides the first portfolio across the table at us. And it's by Michael Whalen, who's an absolutely astonishing artist. If you've never seen his stuff, look him up. He's amazing. Whale and Michael Whalen, W-H-E-L-A-N. Oh, Whalen, okay. Whalen. And Michael lifted the first page just enough to see a square inch of the artwork. And he went, oh, and his knees began to buckle. Oh, 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 oh. And all of that was being telegraphed to me through his elbow, through uh, his shoulders, through his knees. I had, he went through an absolute aesthetic orgasm, something on a par with St. Teresa's experience of God filling her and taking her aloft over the face of the earth. Whoa. Um, and I saw a quality of awe and wonder that I didn't think was possible in a human being that I had never ever imagined before. That is the second law of science. Um, look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there. 
come to life. Michael saw more in a painting by Michael Whalen that Michael Whalen had ever imagined was in I that painting. That. I love that. I love that. So deep and so like um, playful. Right. So I am utterly committed to Michael. Mm. Um, he is my life. In other words, he is the incarnation of the two principles that have made me. And it's hard for me, as you can see, to talk about him in the past tense at all. He's a looming presence. And in the book, I try to give you in the book, I try to give you a sense of who Michael Jackson really was, a sense that you apparently aren't going to get anyplace else. I thought it was so obvious that everybody who wrote about him would convey it. But Michael Jackson fans who've read everything ever written about him have told me, no, your book is really the first to get across who Michael really was. And in that book, I say, if you loved Michael Jackson, then you knew him more than anyone who has ever written about him. You sensed something about him that was basic to him. You sensed his gift. Michael had this enormous gift for all wonder and surprise. He felt it was a gift from God. He felt it was because it was a gift from God, it was his obligation to give that quality of all wonder and surprise to his kids. Mm -hmm. And the first law of science, the truth at any price, including the price of your life, that came alive in another encounter with Michael. Um, one day I was sitting at my desk on 55th Street and Lexington Avenue, um, and I kept a little red nylon $19.95 bargain knapsack behind my desk with the first laptop computer, the TRS-100, mm -hmm. um, which carried an entire, came with an entire 8K of memory, that you could goose it if you were a geek, up to 24K of memory. <laughs> so mine was goose. You knew how to do and, that. Yes, and, um, and it had a spare shirt and it had a razor blade and, and a toothbrush. All the necessities. Um, because, yes, because I used to get calls at very unexpected times mm -hmm. for urgent situations. So I got a call at four o'clock in the afternoon saying, you've got to be out here by 11 o'clock tonight. Michael is canceling his tour and you're the only one he will listen to. Can you imagine being the only person Michael Jackson will listen to? To. to be honest, to be. I can't imagine you being the only person Michael Jackson would listen to. Well, that's very sweet, Jen. I couldn't imagine I'm not it. trying to be sweet. Yeah. So at any rate, I, I, was, I, arrived, I arrived in LA, uh, got my rental car, went to the address that I'd been given. It was spooky. It was strange. I never expected it to be what it was. It was a studio lot. And it was a studio lot with seven aircraft hangar-sized buildings, all of them dark. Only one had light. And no matter how bright the light, it was swallowed by the darkness of the building, by the hugeness of the building. And I walked into this spooky, eerie, mostly dark, some, somewhat lit place, and there was a 110 foot wide stage in front of me. Now to give you an idea of scale, when ZZ Top decided to take Texas culture to the world, they were my band, um, they had a, a giant stage in the shape of the state of Texas, um, tilted at an angle so everybody in the audience could see that it was in the shape of the state of Texas. And it was 75 feet wide. The Jackson stage was about 50% larger than, than that stage. So I waited for them to finish rehearsing and there was a dressing trailer outside. Well, you and I know what a dressing trailer is. Some people may not. It's like a, it's a big van, a huge van, and it's been converted into a dressing room so that you can ride it, you can take it anywhere, you know, just drive it someplace new um, when the set changes. So we all filed into this dressing trailer. There were two banquettes of red uh, plastic seats on either side, and there was a little tiny banquette by the door that was the throne. The brothers took the banquettes, Michael took the throne, I took the seat to his immediate left-hand side. Um, and Michael explained something to me. The tour had been getting incredibly awful publicity. Dave Marsh in particular, who was a lead sheep in the press. In other words, everybody copied what he wrote. Um, he wrote something, everybody else said it. Yeah. Um, and Dave Marsh said, look, we, meaning the rock critic elite, we know everybody in the business. Michael has not hired anybody we, buddy, but he, we know to do the staging, so the stage is gonna collapse. Michael has not hired anybody that we know to do the sound system, so the sound system is gonna electrocute the performers. Michael has not hired anybody that we know to do the lighting. So these five story high lighting trusses are gonna collapse on the heads of the audience and kill people. 
and nobody that we know has been hired to do security. So gangs are going to be running up and down the aisles, cutting people up with knives, and parents won't dare send their kids to a Michael Jackson or a Jackson's Victory Tour concert. Wow. So that was the press we were getting. Michael explained why the tour had been open to this negative publicity. He said, look, God gave me this quality of all wonder and surprise. I owe it to my kids, no matter what. So a year and a half ago, I found the best staging people, the best sound people, the best lighting people, the best magicians and special effects people, and I signed them all to a non-disclosure agreement. Why? Why an agreement of secrecy? Because I wanted to take my audience utterly by surprise. I wanted to give them the quality of wonder and surprise that I get. And my brother Jackie, he said, is the best dancer I have ever seen in my life. Now think of that statement. Michael was the greatest student of dance in the 20th century. He studied at the feet of James Brown and Fred Astaire. Um, he knew every move. He had invented entirely new dance moves. And he was saying that his brother Jackie was the best dancer he had ever seen. That's an astonishing statement. And he said, and my brother Jackie has come down with a bone chip in his knee. Well, I knew that because three weeks or four weeks earlier, I had flown to LA to set up a press conference with the surgeons who had done arthroscopic surgery on uh, Jackie's knee. Mm -hmm. And he said, we expected Jackie to be ready in time for the tour. He's not ready. And I have to postpone the tour until my brother Jackie is ready to go on stage because otherwise I'm gonna cheat my audience of what I need to give them the most. And I explained to him the precarious state in which this tour was and how because of the low credibility of the tour and the criticisms thrown at the tour, parents wouldn't dare send their kids or take their kids to these concerts. And if Michael postponed his tour, it would give credibility to all of the rumors of amateurish, amateurishness. Um, and it would lose Michael his audience. And it was like two prophets going up against each other, Jen. I mean, if you've ever seen The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, it was two Charlton Hestons parting the Red Sea. We both were utterly and completely committed to our truths. I was utterly and completely committed to Michael's best interest, to his brother's best interest, and to his audience's best interest. And I wouldn't let anything fuck with them just like Michael wouldn't let anything fuck with them. And I had, for the first time and possibly the only time in my life, I had, I've had about five visions in my life. Every single one of them has come true. But for the very first time, I had a visual vision. All the others are gut level visions. Um, and I saw Michael's ribs as golden gates. And I saw those golden gates swing open. And I saw 10,000 kids in Michael's chest. Michael's commitment to the truth at any price, including the price of your life, was absolute. Absolute. And he agreed to go on with the tour at the scheduled time. So that's it. Michael was the living embodiment, the living incarnation of the first two rules of science that have been the backbone of my life since I was 12 years old. Plus, when Michael was on stage, he was possessed. Mm -hmm. He was possessed by that ecstatic force. He had enormous discipline. Mm -hmm. It took enormous discipline to do each move exactly correctly. Mm -hmm. But it also took that flame, that fire of the human soul. It took the gods inside because his goal, he knew it, was to rouse the gods inside of his audience. He knew it, even if that wasn't his vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So here's what you have to know about Michael. In 1954, Every sports physiolo physiologist alive said that it was impossible for a human being to break the four minute mile. It had never been done because it could never be done. And then a medical student in Britain and another medical student who was a friend of his got together and they analyzed every single step in his running and they removed every single energy wasting move. And the guy's name was Roger Bannister and he broke the four minute mile. Since then, it is normal for uh, a global competitive runner to break the four minute mile. 1800 people have done it. Um, in Michael's case, 
Michael set a standard for awe, wonder, surprise, and commitment that I want the world to see because I wanted to do for awe, wonder, surprise, and commitment what Roger Bannister did for the four minute mile. That's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So this is the, uh, this is a part of the essence of Einstein, Michael Jackson and me. So where are we at as a collective? As, far as a collective, as, as a collective five, it was 10, 15 years ago. Um, my friend, um, oh God, what is his name? Uh, Tom Silverman. Um, my friend Tom Silverman founded Tommy Boy Records and is now worth millions as a consequence. Um, and he founded something called the New Music Seminar. And sometime in the 1990s, it went dead. And in 2005, he revived it and he insisted that I be a special guest, which is weird because I only go to things where I'm speaking and I wasn't invited to speak. And on stage was a, an old acquaintance of mine named Ted Cohn. And Ted Cohn was working with Ben Harper who I think is one of the most remarkable singers ben of Harper. the last 20 years. Yeah. Oh, I love him. Yes, I he's, he's phenomenal. Yeah. So Ted was bragging about the ginger ale tie-ins and the automobile tie-ins and the other commercial tie-ins um, that he had secured for Ben Harper. And I stood up and said, Ted, you know I love you, but you're killing Ben Harper. Ben Harper's one of those singers who sings with gravel, guts, and blood in his voice. Mm -hmm. And you are depriving his audience of who he really is. You are depriving his audience of the kind of icons that I used to create mm -hmm. back in the 1970s and 1980s. You are, you are committing a sin. And that sin continues to this very day. And that sin is depriving a culture, a civilization of the icons it needs so that the next generation can grow up on gleaming beacons of soul and gleaming beacons of gods within. Mm -hmm. So the icon is to illuminate what resides inside all of us. Yes, and, and more than that, every generation, ever since 1815, every new generation has grown up with an entirely new set of technologies. You've probably seen pictures on YouTube of babies, 12 months old, 18 months old, with iPads in their hands. Mm -hmm. And they're scrolling through that. They know the real estate of the internet better than you and I ever will. And they're able to flip around within it with astonishing precision. And one day, uh, a friend of mine, who's another filmmaker, Mark Lafia, is also a fine artist. So he had a showing of his artwork and he invited me. And um, afterwards, there was a little after dinner party or, or after whatever it's called, gallery party. And he invited me to that too. And sitting across the table from me were two guys about 35 years old. And both of them had little kids. And one explained that his little kid had been curious about submarines since he was three years old. Mm -hmm. And I'd been using Google to find out just about everything you could find out about submarines. And at the age of five, he was now a bachelor's of science level expert in <laughs> submarines. And, and the other parent said, yeah, that's happened to me too. My son is five. And he's a bachelor's of science level expert in dinosaurs. So, so, but because every new generation grows up with a radically new technology and a radically new society, um, every new generation grows up with a set of feelings that thinks are insane. There are kids who turn 12, their hormones begin to flow, they're going through a, a change, a radical change, and they have feelings that they think are just totally off the wall, they never dare confess them to a single human. And then they go to a concert, like a Joan Jett concert, for example, and, and let's say they're girls. The previous generation of girls, their moms all stayed at home and picked them up at school and fed them milk and cookies when they got home. Um, but the generation after that, the mothers, the fathers all got up in the morning, got into their suits, went down to breakfast, ate their cornflakes, picked up their briefcases and left for a distant place called the city, a whole different world. Um, and their mom came down in her power pants suit and picked up her briefcase mm -hmm. and went off to work. Um, so the kids growing up with two working parents had an entirely different set of feelings when they came, when they hatched at the age of 12 um, into puberty. Mm -hmm. And they were certain that they were alone in those feelings. And then they go to a Joan Jett concert 
and Joan Jett is standing on stage with an instrument that women are not allowed to touch, the lead guitar, and she is at the center of the stage, not like Grace Slick, who's part of a band, mm -hmm. um, or like Janis Joplin, who pretends to be part of a band with Big Brother and the Holding Company, yeah. um, and she is it. And she's the one raising her fist. Mm -hmm. And believe me, that gesture of raising your fist in John Mellencamp, it means one thing. In Joan Jett, it means another, because there's a slight difference. In Billy Idol, it means something else. Um, and suddenly, Joan is telling you, your feelings are not insane. You are not alone. Why? Joan is reflecting and expressing those feelings in the very way she stands, in the very way she takes the stage, in every muscle movement that she makes. And suddenly, 10 million women realize they are not insane, they are not alone, they are part of a movement. Mm -hmm. And that is part of what an icon does, expresses the inexpressible feelings of a new generation. And so as a collective, right now in 2020, where do you think we're at in terms of like the consciousness evolution? What is our... I, I think we're in an incredible place despite the COVID thing. I mean, just look at the COVID thing. Um, there's an old bloomism. Um, we're, lacking, I, we're lacking the icon that you're talking about. We're lacking the icons totally. And so that's having a negative impact? It's having a negative impact because kids don't have something they can believe in mm -hmm. um, to grow up on. And uh, if they're, I mean, imagine growing up on Ben Harper. I mean, Ben Harper is magnificent, but you only know that through his voice. You only know that through his music. You don't know his story. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know who he is. You can't grow up on who but he is. But isn't this something that people can still cultivate? Like, do they need an external figure? Apparently they do, because I had to, look, my approach to publicity was unlike anything that had ever been seen in the business. And when I left, it left with me. Um, this is why I tried to give it to Jeff to the best of my limited abilities. But we're, um, in, a, we're in a time of expansion though, regardless, right. right? Yeah, we're in a time, look, okay, here's the deal. In uh, 1918, when the Spanish flu hit, um, people were quarantined, like they're quarantined now. The Spanish flu hit in four waves. The first wave came in March, like our COVID. Um, the second wave came in October and killed far more people. And then there were two more waves over the next two years. That's what we're in for. But think of what's happened. In those days, if you had been quarantined, you would have been home alone or with your family and incapable of reaching out beyond your household. Mm -hmm. Today, we have the internet. What is everybody discovering? Everybody's discovering that, hey, we can get work done just as easily at home. We don't need to be in an office building right. anymore. So we have taken a radical jump mm -hmm. from where we were in 1918. We don't understand the blessings that we got. In the plague in Athens, in roughly 4 BC, bodies were piled up in the streets. Um, in the potato famine in Ireland, bodies were piled up. So in you're the talking streets. about the resources that we have in order to keep our lives going. And yes. Also stay connected and, and maybe even find cre creative solutions. Right. And simplify so, things. Yes. So we're, you and I are talking right now from LA to Park Slope, Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, and Zoom didn't exist five years ago, mm -hmm. um, and, but it exists now and we're, people are holding Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. I mean, over serious business. Um, and they're discovering, look, I was forced into this in 1988. I was forced onto the internet, but that's before the World Wide Web existed. That's before browsers existed. Um, that's before highly visual websites existed. And now we have all kinds of tools and Zoom seems to be the winner among the tools. Mm -hmm. um, not Skype, not SteamYard. There are a bunch then, but of there's also like, have you, been, have you been finding this in your world and your network that a lot of people are also energetically purging a lot and, and bringing up old patterns and breaking old belief structures? Like it seems to be a time of um, deconstruction. Well, they're breaking old ways of doing things because the nine to five day has changed. Mm -hmm. You do it at home. Mm -hmm. um, they are adapting to a whole new landscape, the internet, mm -hmm. which is a whole new world. Um, that may well change their minds over the course of time. 
as that stuff bubbles to the surface in the verbal brain, um, where reason happens. Um, people are hoping, some people, like the love of my life, who I separated from, unfortunately, in March because of the COVID crisis, um, she believes it's the end of the world and we're going to have an absolute Armageddon and Armageddon is going to be good for us because the world will be re reconstructed at last in a good and just way. Mm. Well, all of that is fantasy. The world is not going to fall apart. Look, in, in the 1910s, we had World War I, um, which at that point was the most vicious, appalling war in human history. Mm -hmm. Then we had the Spanish influenza of 1918 to 1920. Um, we had the uh, communist revolution in 1817 um, in Russia. And people who thought it was going to be the end of the world and revolutions like the communist revolution would go global yeah. had, had we, every right to think. It's been these cycles for, forever is what you're saying. Right. And just think of what happened after the Spanish flu in 1920. We had a decade called the Roaring Twenties. It was amazing. Actually. Mary yeah. Hey, there's yeah. some people like posting questions and comments. Do you want to hear a couple things? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, do, do you have anything to say about icons other than rock stars? Yeah, I mean, a film star, look, or Robert Redford like has- epic, Ro Robert, Someone brought up yeah. icons or Greta in terms of climate change. Like, do you think of icons outside of entertainment? Yeah, we have icons all over the place. Okay. Um, but you should see how hard it is to fight to be an icon. Um, out of the one out of every 10 million people who set their lives on the course of becoming iconic, uh, make it. Uh, the How other do you nine. Define that word because everyone I talk to has a different take on the word. Even an icon is one of those people who expresses the group soul, um, who expresses it so profoundly that it gives the icon becomes the tongue of a subculture. So it, for you, it does not mean simply being super famous. It means being super famous and coming from a place that would, in these days would be called authenticity. So there's a lot of people that are famous that you would not consider iconic. Absolutely, absolutely. Could there, Most be, are the, just, could there be the iconic anti-icon? <laughs> uh, there will be. Um, I mean, uh, Donald Trump is the iconic anti-icon. There you go, okay. Because icon and, literally by, by de definition in a dictionary just means image. Yeah, it just means image. It's like you know, a button I, that you push, you know? Right, right. So yeah. I must, we have had the luxury of being able to radically redefine and put new layers on the meaning of the word icon. Why? Because we have recording technologies, we have videotaping technologies. We can actually see the icons of the past. Do you, like, see, like, do you see like another side of icon? Do you see like a dangerous side, not just like the glorious mystical side i don't see the dark side i mean okay. yes look look at what donald trump is able to do he has a cult um the cult includes roughly 35 percent of the american population that cult has been encouraged to be rough tough beat people up and use its guns um that is very dangerous that is satanic and what does that um, say about the collective because he only can have that power if we give him that power so what is the human consciousness looking for? What are we I gave, I did a study a long, long time ago of uh, the pop charts, which you would think are not relevant to that question, and discovered that basically the people who were making it big on the pop charts represented four different subcultures. At one point, those subcultures were called the preppy subculture, the head subculture, um, the, uh, um, I don't know, the sports, the jock subculture, and and the rest um and icons speak for a subculture well one subculture's salvation is another subculture's damnation mm -hmm. to you and me if the trumpites the trump worshipers manage to take over this country and get rid of all the democrats who they are sure are uh, satanic satanic uh followers who sacrifice small children after having sex with them um if those people save the world in their as as through in their perceptual frame of saving the world that would be utter destruction and hell for you and me mm -hmm. so one culture's god is another culture's demon mm -hmm. and there are always multiple subcultures in the group mind see i see so, that in in celebrity culture too you know how do you see it which artists 
Um, no, I just, in terms of the uh, pathology of right. celebrity culture. Um, right. So what do you see as the pathology? pathology sometimes I see that it's, it's destructive to the collective consciousness, you know, in a way that uh, people, it like, it helps to enforce people's inadequacies or, or unworthiness. Like, right. you, like what you're talking about is that direct relationship that um, is the ideal where right. it's like the icon, like I kind of said before, illuminates what I know resides inside of me. It's not right. that you as the icon are the one that gets to be like that and I don't. So I'm on right. a lower plane. Right. But when you're dealing with like fragile minds and fragile beings, vulnerable, victimized mentalities and all these different things we're plagued with, sometimes when they idolize, it actually helps to diminish their worth. Well, back in 1988, in 1981, These I had kids helped. Kids are like literally committing suicide over how many like likes they're getting. Um, right. Granted, it's a deeper root. I'm saying that's a byproduct, but it's like there's something about idolization that I think is not always um, helpful. Right. Well, it can be. I mean, I had uh, I had a friend who had five kids, mm -hmm. and uh, she went off to Europe with a jazz musician, and she deposited each of her kids with the different friends, and we got her oldest daughter, mm -hmm. and her oldest daughter was a worshiper of Bob Marley, mm -hmm. my, the artist who would later become my artist, um, and um, she had Bob worshiper. Marley. Yeah. Uh, yeah, she had Bob Marley's pictures over her all over her walls. And she was leading a useless life. And because she was leading a useless life, she was deeply depressed. Or she was leading a useless life because she was deeply depressed. It was circular. Mm -hmm. um, but whether Bob Marley lifted her out of that for a minute um, every once in a while and was helpful to her or was the cause of her state is very hard to tell. I would suspect that she was going to be that way. She was going to be a basket case. Mm -hmm. And that Merle must have lifted her a little bit. And then she married a, uh, a Rasta and had a child by him. And then he was shot because there are a lot of gang wars in the Rastafari in the world. So uh, it's hard to tell. It's, uh, all, it's, com it's complex. I don't, I don't think it's right. one thing. And I don't think it would be the fault of one thing. Right. I think it's just that it's an interesting, very, very old paradigm to right. look at and how does it serve humanity now right. where we're at to have these overarching larger than life idols, like, you know, what does it do for us today? You know? Well, it, it's been doing it for a long time because back in ancient Greece, um, philosophers fought to be yeah. acknowledged as the king of the philosophers. Mm -hmm. So, Plato competed with a lot of other philosophers in order to get to be, to be the king of the philosophers in his time. And then uh, Aristotle in the next generation competed very heavily with a lot of other philosophers to be the king of the philosophers in his time. What does being the king of the philosophers mean? It means that you get a huge amount of mass attention. And, uh, and you become a guiding star. You become an icon. You become somebody other people grow on. You become that Roger Bannister figure that yeah. other people try to emulate and outdo. Um, and, and another guy um, I tried to get into this race to be the biggest of those to deal with geometry, which was a vital part of Plato's philosophy. Um, and he put together the iconic book, uh, Euclid's Elements, which if you ever took geometry in high school, um, it was all based on Euclid's elements. We're still paying attention to Euclid um, 2,100 years later. So there are, there's an important role for these icons as guiding stars for our lives. And, if, and they for the good, if they have good intentions, it helps. Yes, yes. In 1988, because I helped establish rap music with Sylvia Robinson and Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and because I had worked with uh, Run DMC, who mainstreamed rap, um, I was asked by a, a very hot new record company, I think it was Jive, 
to work with one of their artists. And he was part of something new, gangster rap. And I went over his lyrics and they were about killing people. And I called them back and said, look, I can't work with this artist given what his lyrics are. Um, if you let me go down to Philadelphia where he lives and talk to him and get him to rewrite some of these lyrics, I could possibly work with him, but not with lyrics that advocate killing other people. Yeah. So yes, there can be darkly negative um, icons. Yeah, for sure. Um, wow, we could go on for a day and I'm looking at Chelio's drawing and I'm like, so excited to see <laughs> what this is. Chelio, can you come share with us? Yeah. Okay, it's very interesting. Wow. Oh, today, wow. Today I love this thing because you I... You see it, Howard? Then... Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's this wonderful. Is, this is Howard, but it's Howard 200 years ago. It's like, uh, it's Howard in many generations, but uh, this is the shoulder, okay? And he decide to build our life, to build the roof, him, decide, uh, this is my read, eh, my point of view about what's happening in this, in this uh, as sketch. And he decide, want to create all world, all light or successful or what's up. You but create your design. own world, you know? Right, yeah. exactly. But it's a little bit in the dark. It's because thinking about this and want about this. It's more sure later. Because the expression is, yes, I have to do this. And here, have expression. Like a now. laboratory. You go inside right. and do the work. It's a smart yeah. expression. Like, yes, I have to do this. Mm. Right. It's focus on the life. Right. And Whoa. Go ahead, he is uh, Howard, I think so, because you know, these have a point of situation. Right. He say want, want, what he wants, he's a square, but the focus is perfect. But he see, he says, and then he see, and he says, and you see the face and says, focus what you say. Like, right. uh, I know this, and then I want this. This point of view, and say something. You have a lot right. of focus, Howard. You, you manifest. That's terrific. You manifest. And all what you do it is perfect in the place, perfect. This and this this on this, this on this, and somewhere is the same point of focus, point of focus, point of focus, <laughs> like point antennas. of focus. <laughs> it's like you uh, put order in your life, okay? Uh, because you want this, you dream this, you know, and smart, because in this life you need to be either smart or, or crocodile hit you and see something say something all in perfect place this there this there this there but some person is in your life too and <laughs> all is perfect in perfect position and but it also it also reminds me of how you create your own schedule like you don't sleep and eat and do things according to the social norm norm right and so this idea of like constructing your life and constructing your reality and having these different po points of focus really yeah. like reminds me of you you know yeah, that, what that's br so brilliant shelly oh thank you what surprised me is this is you uh mature you right uh, in this time in this epoch but what uh take my heart very happy today is your face your expression after your battle your war with the world your smart in your think your position you have a very relaxed face full of 
compassion about the world and fighting uh -huh. and have need the food need compassion your face is full of love oh. wow charlio that's that's lovely so yeah. after you do you go in the laboratory you do the work you figure everything out there's thinking 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 and then you're relaxed and you're light and yeah. you're full of love and then you yeah say, i love and then i'm compassion i fight for the people i want to help somebody because this world after all these the most important is to be compassion love only love win and then you very relaxed look at how so relaxed you are <laughs> you, you saw the truth in this side is smaller but is feminine inside it's like a grandmother or mother this feminine side can dream about you and then help you with the love. You go, you win, you have to do it. Yes, you believe in what you want. This is a family. Your angels are feminine. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and this is in totally is uh, you build your roof for your life in secret. You understand, you show your face. Yes. You're and on then a mission. Behind you have your smart because you are smart. Because it's right. And then you see what you have to do, and then you say what you do it, and put all things in right place. Conclusion yeah. is all my life, but the best is give love, compassion, and then you respect the wish of your family. This contest, I don't know you recognize or something about your past, but this is like 200 years ago person. This is beautiful. Like, like not rich or I don't know, but rich of uh, love. Well, and that then, was the age of enlightenment. Um, that's yeah? perfect. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I'm <laughs> here. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I'm excited because coming these beautiful things. Uh, Howard, uh, thank you for giving me, and then I received this beautiful story about you. I, I don't know is my read, but I feel this now because I'm so fast when I do it, and then it's right. possible to think about this. But what we from 200 maybe three or 100 i don't know is love for life love That's... for uh, this world because it's beautiful all these things is nice all these for live well but we don't forget uh, this world need love we have to do first the other tell us you understand? That's wonderful. Maybe? Yes, it's you wonderful. It's are wonderful. the epitome of rock star and the epitome of love. And Chelio <laughs> captured it. And someday we'll have to tell you about what I learned from the great love of my life. But that's oh. a subject for another conversation. Yeah, and we, we'll, we're going to schedule a catch up too. Like, a, right. we need more time. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chelio. I'll be welcome. Thank anyway, you, Kellyo. This is like a really special drawing. Yeah. How a special, are... special guest, special guest, special, special guest. Drawing. Yes. <laughs> Howard's very special to me. Thank you so much, Howard. Thanks, Jan. I'll see you again soon, and we'll discuss great loves of our lives. You gave so much energy today. Well, the... <laughs> I can't help it. That's just the norm. We covered a lot of territory. Right, except it's not just the norm because it's you. And I have a very special relationship with you. And you are very, very special to me. And you light me up with energy. Yes, and I feel the same. And I just want to be walking around Prospect Park with you because I don't mind insects anymore. Right, oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, my body has a terrible response to insects. Okay, okay. I will let you go. Okay. Um, I love you. Jen, 
I adore you. I adore you. Um, so keep me up to date on what you're doing. Okay, I'm going to reach out in the next day or two. All right. Lots of love. Okay. Bye, Bye. Jen. Bye.